We are in the middle of a stewardship series, our annual stewardship series. Um, if you're not familiar with us at the Cornerstone Church, there are certain things we cover every year and certain series that we have every year and stewardship is one of them and today we want to continue that series. Last week um, we watched a video by Pastor Robert Morris. How many of you were here for that? How many of you enjoyed that? We watched a video by Pastor Robert Morris um, entitled, Who's the Owner? Looking at who owns our stewardship. And we began the series the week before that when Pastor Emmanuel blessed us with a wonderful message called The God Who Multiplies. And today we want to continue in that series. So do you have a Bible? Electronic or hard version? Does anyone still carry a hard version of the Bible, by the way? Fantastic. There's nothing beats turning those, those pages. And I find that when you've become so accustomed to um, the Bible on your app, on, on your phone, when it comes to turning to pages again, you forget where certain books are. You have to really take time to, to find them. Or how many of you have been in that situation before where you've been in the church and the pastor will say, turn to a scripture and you can't quite get to the scripture. So you just pretend like you found it and you're reading there, but really you're reading off the screen because he's asked you to turn to Habakkuk and you didn't know Habakkuk was a book in the Bible, but it's all good. Either which way you're gonna find it, whether it's on paper or whether it's in your phone, it's all good. Have you found the book of John? You probably haven't because I didn't tell you to go to John, did I? Okay, turn with me to John. John chapter 12. As always, we're reading from the New King James Version of the Bible. Have you found John 12? Just one person. Have you found John 12? Yeah. I'm reading from verse 1 onwards. It says, Then six days before the Passover, Jesus came to Bethany where Lazarus was, who had been dead, whom he had raised from the dead. There they made him a supper, and Martha served, but Lazarus was one of those who sat at the table with him. Then Mary took a pound of very costly oil or spikenard, anointed the feet of Jesus and wiped his feet with her hair. And the house was filled with the fragrance of the oil. But one of his disciples, Judas Iscariot, Simon, Simon's son, who would betray him said, why was this fragrant oil not sold for 300 denarii and given to the poor? This he said, not that he cared for the poor, but because he was a thief and had the money box and he used to take what was put in it. But Jesus said, let her alone. She has kept this for the day of my burial. Verse eight, for the poor you have with you always, but me you do not have always, amen. So the title of what I wanna share with you briefly today um, is a question, which is quite common with me these days. It's two words and it's simply who's winning, who's winning. So do me a favor, turn to two, three, two or three people around you and just ask them who's winning. Who's winning is a question that we often ask when two competitors are going at each other. Whether it's a slanging match in the playground. How many of you remember slanging matches in the playground? How many of you remember those days? Some of you are pretending like you don't know because you were part of it. Back in the day in the playground. How many of you remember back in school days where if you cuss someone's mum, that was it? Yeah. That was like you've crossed the boundary. That was the... That was the line. Now that doesn't even mean anything these days. You, call, you cut someone's mum back in the day like fly kick randomly out of nowhere. Nowadays, the young people, they just uh, unfortunately pull out a gun on you or one thing or the other. But when we ask the question, who's winning? It's a question we often ask when two competitors are going at each other, whether that's a slanging match in the, pro in the playground, like I mentioned, whether it's politicians in a race uh, for votes, whether it's two boxers in the ring, whether it's sports teams, up against one another. It's a question that we often ask out of curiosity to see which way a contest is leaning at that particular moment. Of course, there are two exceptions to asking that question, who's winning? One, whenever somebody is in competition against myself, whether it be in the cards or table tennis, as Chima found out last week, and as Pastor Emmanuel has been finding out over the weeks, then of course, it's a stupid question to ask who's winning because we always know that I am winning and everybody online said amen and everyone in the church said, okay. <laughs> and the second exception, of course, is when Arsenal's playing because we all know that Arsenal are never winning. And even if they are winning, they're likely to end up losing the match. So we know those are the two exceptions. But 
jokes aside, my question to you this morning is, who's winning? And what do I mean when I ask that question? Well, generosity and selfishness often tend to occupy the same space, both literally and both spiritually. They tend to occupy the same space in arenas like this. Amongst us, we will have generous people. Amongst us, we will have not so generous people. But also when it comes to our giving and the nature of our heart. When it comes to the nature of our heart, when it comes to giving, when it comes to selflessness, when it comes to generosity, these two characters that we just read about in John chapter 12, both Mary and Judas are at war with one another in our hearts. My question to you is, who is winning that war? And before you answer that question in your heart, I want us to unpack this story and I want us to look at what we can learn about ourselves and our heart towards giving by looking at the differences between Mary and Judas, which is selflessness and selfishness. Okay. Now, in the scripture that we just read in John chapter 12, the Bible tells us that Mary pours a very costly fragrant oil onto the feet of Jesus. Of course, to say that something is very costly is subjective because costly is subjective to each and every one of us. But Judas knew exactly how much it cost. He said, why was this, why was this poured onto the feet of Jesus? Why was this wasted when this is about 300 denarii? Judas knew exactly how expensive this fragrant oil was. In case you're not aware, if you study the text more closely, 300 denarii is the equivalent of one year's worth of wages. So do me a favor, think about how much you earn right now in, in a year. Think about that figure in your head. If you're not working, think about how much you would like to earn per annum. Do you have that figure in your head? Do you have that figure in your head? Okay. Now that you have that figure in your head, let me ask you a question. How many of you would spend that much on a fragrant oil? None of us. Someone said, no way. Okay. Even if you were on minimum wage, by the way, we're talking 14 to 15 grand. Okay. If you were on minimum wage. So you've got that amount in your head as to how much you earn a year. This was the equivalent of one year's worth of wages. And no one here said that they would spend that much on fragrant oil. But let's imagine that you did. Let's just imagine somehow, some way you did. How many of you would manage it sparingly? Or how many of you would just use it anyhow? You wouldn't, right? You would protect it, you would guard it because it was so expensive. But guess what? Mary did not think twice about the price of this costly oil. She poured it out onto the feet of Jesus. Then she used her hair to wipe the feet of Jesus. Without thinking twice about her wig or her natural hair, she pours this oil, all of it out onto the feet of Jesus and uses her hair to wipe it. This, people, isn't just a significant act of giving. This is a significant act of generosity. And as I mentioned earlier, let it not be mistaken, the people knew how much this oil cost, especially Judas who was quick to speak up. Judas was like, mm, this could have been sold and given to the poor. But the scripture makes it clear that he didn't care for the poor. The reason why Judas said that is because he was a thief. He stole from the money box. So he was more interested in the fact that actually, if this was sold, this money would have been put in the money box and then it would have been more for me to take. Now, let me clarify something with you. This money box mentioned in the scripture here is the equivalent of what we would refer to as the offering box today. It's the very same thing. It's the same money box that when Jesus would finish speaking, the people would put money in, okay? So let's just all be on the same page in that regard. Now that we're clear with that, let me ask you another question. How many of you, like Judas, would steal from the offering box? Anyone? No? Okay, so my question then is, why do many of you do it? Silence. Why do many of you do it? What do I mean? Well, let me clarify. Malachi chapter three, verse eight says this. 
Will a man rob God, yet you have robbed me? But you say, in what way have we robbed you? That was the question that the people have asked. How have we robbed you? And the response from God is very simple. In tithes and offering. The reason why I ask the question, why do many of you do it? It's because we can be very quick to look at Judas in disgust for stealing from the offering box. But we do the very same thing, but just in a slightly different way. And I'll show you how we do it. So I'm going to ask Femi to come up. And Femi has some money on him. Okay. How much money have you got there? Femi's got 10 pounds, right? If I take that 10 pounds from Femi, without asking him, without him giving it to me, without his permission, have I stolen from him? Talk to me. Yeah. Have I stolen from him? Yes, okay. So I've stolen 10 pounds from Femi. This is how Ju Judas stole money from the offering box. He would take the money from the offering box and keep it for himself. Now let me ask you another question. If I owe Femi 20 pounds, I owe him 20 pounds, and I give him 10 pounds, have I robbed from him? Have I robbed from him? Yeah. If I owe him 20 pounds and I give him 10 pounds, have I stolen from him? Talk to me. I've stolen from him, right? Why? Because I've not given him what is rightly his. This is still stealing. And this is what many of us do when it comes to God. We hold back more than what is right and we don't give to him the tithe and the offering that belongs to him. Can I have my money back, please? Thank you. Give him a round of applause. This is why Proverbs 11:24 says, there is one who scatters yet increases more and there is one who withholds more than what is right and it leads to poverty. So before you look at Judas and discuss, ask yourself, do you fall into the latter category of that verse? The one that withholds more than what is right. And the reason why I say that is because when you look at Malachi 3, 8 clearly, the people said, how have you robbed me? And God did not say in tithes. He didn't say in offerings. He said in tithes and offerings, which means there is an expectation of us to give both, not one or the other. And so when we give off our tithes, but we don't give our offerings, we are robbing God. When we give off our offerings and we don't give our tithes, we're robbing God. When we don't give off any, we are robbing God. Ask the person next to you who's winning. And many of us do that. And then we go on to say things like, I love God wholeheartedly. But do we really? Because you don't withhold from someone that you love. Jesus said that we should love him with all of our heart, our soul, and our mind. And what is interesting to note is that in the same way Judas had his reasons as to what could be done with the oil as a cover-up for Mary's giving to God, many of us have our own cover-up reasons. Oh, but the church is going to run away with my money. Wrong. It's not your money. It's God's money. He just asked you to steward it. Just a cover-up reason that we use to withhold our giving. All the church talk about is money. That's why I don't give. Mm, not really. I mean, we might talk about it three or four weeks in a year in a few minutes around offering time. But hey, if we want to be like Christ, then we should talk about money because Christ spoke about money more than he did any other thing whilst he was here on earth. In other words, Christ spoke about more money more than he did salvation, more than he did prayer, more than he did faith. Why? Because money is very closely linked to idolatry, if you're not careful. And God wants our heart. So if we're going to be Christ-like, then we need to get comfortable with talking about money. And again, people have too many cover-up reasons. And typically when people are uncomfortable with a series, like the one that we're doing now, they'll say things in their heart like, we get the point, Pastor K, can we move on to something different now? This series is, is, is too long because... They are really battling when it comes to idolatry and money in their heart. And the list of reasons that people give as a cover up, just like Judas did, is endless. And I have seen so many people who are happy to give to worldly things that don't profit the soul over giving to God and God's kingdom that does profit their soul. I've seen people invest in appearance more than they ever would the kingdom of God. 
they would spend 50, 60, 70 pounds on a pair of shoes, trainers, a jacket, but would never put that amount in the offering box. They will invest in WizKid ministry, in Burner Boys ministry. And I have no problem with that. I have no problem with you going and to concerts and being entertained and the like. I have a problem when it's a struggle for you to give that to God who blesses you, but you'd prefer to give it to someone who's going to give you entertainment that doesn't know you, doesn't know your heart and is clearly after your money alone and isn't giving you anything in return but entertainment. I have a problem. I have a problem if you can look at your spending and your statement and your life and you can say, actually, I've given more things in terms of money. I've given my money to more things that don't bless the kingdom of God, that don't profit my soul over things that I should. In other words, when you look at your statement and you look at, remember Jesus said, where your treasure is, there your heart is. He didn't say where your heart is, there your treasure is. That's how we read it. Where your money goes, your heart follows. So look at your statement and ask yourself, where is my heart going? Because your money, your spending is a reflection of your priorities. And we can be very quick, as I say, to spend on appearance, to spend on entertainment that doesn't profit our soul over giving to the kingdom of God. Ask the person next to you who's winning. Now, as I said, some of the reasons that people give sound good to the ear, but I have found that if you really want to do something, you will find a way. And I think many people make excuses as a cover up, but actually if they wanted to give, they would find a way. And my question is who is winning, Mary or Judas in this tug of war in your heart, selflessness or selfishness? Now, speaking of Judas, let me ask you a couple of further questions. Um, who chose Judas as one of the 12? Talk to me, Jesus. Did Jesus know that Judas would betray him before he chose him? Yes, we all agree on that, okay. When Jesus chose Judas, knowing that Judas would betray him, did this same Jesus know that Judas would also steal from him? Yes, we know he did, he's omniscient, he knows everything. So if we know that Jesus knew that Judas was gonna steal from him, my question is, why did Jesus make Judas in charge of the money? If he knew, he was gonna steal from him. Why did he put him in charge of the money box? I'll tell you why. The answer is simple. Oftentimes we are tempted in our area of weakness. Not because Jesus wants to set us up for a failure, but actually he wants us to overcome in those areas that are a challenge to us. He wants us to overcome in areas of weakness for us. He wants us to grow and progress and mature in these areas of weakness in our hearts. And in everything God does, remember, he is looking at the heart. And giving is the most important thing to God because it's a heart issue. And in everything that God does, he looks at the heart. Do you remember 1 Samuel chapter 16, verse 7? God said, I am not like man, for man looks at the outward appearance. However, I look at the countenance or the heart of a man. In 2 Corinthians chapter 9, Verse seven, it says, God loves a cheerful giver. Typically in our Pentecostal churches, that's where we think the verse ends. And so we come dancing up to the offering. Oh, sing, oh, sing, oh, praise the Lord. And we have the offering basket at the front and we smile and we dance, but we don't read the rest of the verse. It says, however, let not each one give out of necessity or grudgingly. Grudgingly means because I feel like I have to, because I feel like I'm forced to. It goes on to say, let each one gives as they what purpose in their heart in everything he's looking at the heart he doesn't want you to give out of necessity he doesn't want you to give out of a grudging spirit feeling like you're being forced to he wants you to give because you love him imagine being in a relationship with somebody who felt compelled to give to you imagine a spouse that just said ah oh, just take just go on i don't care just take it they didn't really want to give to you how would you feel well it's the same with god we give to those who we love generously because we love them. And it should be the same when it comes to our relationship with God. So I ask the question, who's winning, Mary or Judas? Now we know when Judas said that the oil could have been given to the poor, that he wasn't really thinking of the poor. The scripture makes that very clear. 
He wasn't thinking of the poor, he was thinking about himself. It was a cover up so that he could steal more money from, him, for, from the money box for himself. And I've come to find that people who often don't give or who are not generous tend to have one main root cause at the heart of the issue, and that is themselves. All they are thinking about is me, myself, and I. If I give to God, I have less money to spend here. Here can be anything. The saving goal, here can be the holiday, here can be the bills, anything but God. And the root of selfishness is one thinking about themselves over the kingdom of God and over their love towards God. These people often focus on me, myself, and I. What's in it for me? They think along the lines of, if I buy something from the shop, if I invest in a concert, I can tangibly more, more or less see what I'm getting from it. But when I give to the kingdom of God, I don't really feel like I'm, I'm getting anything from it. And people who think like that miss the point altogether because their heart is rooted in selfishness. I think the reason why, personally, I think Mary had no problem pouring oil onto the feet of Jesus, even though it cost the equivalent of one year's salary, is because she wasn't given from a place of, God, what can you do for me? She was given from a place of, God, you have already blessed me. You've already done mighty works for me. I know this because a few moments before this moment that we read in John chapter 12, Jesus had raised her brother Lazarus from the dead. So Mary had already seen what Jesus has done in her life and she was given from a place of gratitude. And sometimes we get it mixed up. We think that giving to God is like investment. I give this and I'm waiting to get more money back. Actually, we're giving from a place of gratitude for what he's already done. So when we come to give, we give to God and we say, Lord, thank you that I'm even in a position to give to you today. Thank you for what you have done in my life. Thank you for giving me sound mind. Thank you for giving me strength. Thank you for giving me provision. And when we get it mixed up, we start to think, oh, but I put this money in the offering box and I didn't get a return. The fact that he died on the cross is more than enough already. He doesn't have to give us anything else. He chooses to give, any, give us more. I think that God is so gracious that he says, test me in giving and see if I will not bless you. I think he's so gracious in the fact that he doesn't need to bless us anymore. He's already paid the price, but he still says, give to me and I will be a blessing to you. When Mary is winning in your heart, you don't ask what's in it for me. You say, Lord, I'm giving to say thank you. I remember speaking to a friend a couple of weeks ago. She was not looking forward to the prospect of having to go back to the office, having worked from home. From such, for such a long time like, like many of us have. And then at one point in the conversation, I just stopped and I said, thank God you got a job to go back to. Because perspective is everything. And it just made me think, isn't it amazing that you're complaining that you have to go back into the office when there are people who are looking for work, who lost their job in the midst of everything. Perspective gratitude and so when I asked the question who is winning I asked that question because this battle between Mary and Judas selfishness and selflessness is going to continue in your heart until you get to a place where your heart disposition is like that of Mary and some of us we are good when it comes to hearing truth but we respond emotionally what do I mean by that we spawn emotionally in that we don't have a head transplant, we have a heart transplant. Sorry, it's the other way around. Rather than having a heart transplant, we're thinking about a head transplant. And what I mean by responding emotionally is that some of us, we're good at hearing the truth, but we respond emotionally in a sense that now that a message like this has gone forth, now that a series such as what we're doing on stewardship has gone forth, we will give in that moment. But give it a couple of months, we go back to normal because we didn't have a heart transplant, we had a head transplant. We were given the moment when we've heard the word and we've been convicted, but then all of a sudden, Christmas is coming up, I need to save that money. I've got these bills coming up, I don't know where my next money's gonna come from, 
and we go back to life as normal. God doesn't want that. He wants change in us. He wants faithfulness in us. He wants consistency in us. And that is what I want you to be able to take away from this morning's message. Ladies and gentlemen, I want you to search your heart and be honest with yourself. I'm going to be honest and say that I know that for many of us, if we were talking about a different topic entirely altogether, for many of us, we would be more open to change. But when it comes to our finances and the money that God has given us to steward, we struggle. I find many a times that when I preach something in church, people may come up to me and ask me questions. I didn't understand that and they seek truth. But when it comes to finances, people don't want to seek truth. They don't want to risk actually hearing the truth that might convict them to change based on the word of God because they want to hold on to money. It's become an idol in their heart. My prayer for you is that you don't become hard of heart, that you're open to what God wants to do in you, that you are open to change, that you are open to conversation in and around this, because God said that thou shall have no other gods before me. And my prayer is that you have not made money a God before you. That when God can say, give this to your neighbor, you're not stingy about it because you know that you are just stewarding what he has given you. When God says, go and bless that family with shopping for the week, you're not stingy behind it because you know that God has given you that money to steward. When God says, go and pay this bill for somebody for the whole month, you're not stingy with that and you're not fighting with him. We've all been there. I've been there when God has said to me, give this money to someone and I've rebuked the devil. And I've said, the devil is a liar. You're not telling me to do that. Or you play chance with God. If they walk this way, then I know you're speaking to me, God. Then they walk that way. If they sit next to me, then they sit next to you. And you use all of these justifications to not give when God wants us to give freely. He wants us to be selfless people. And if God says give, then let go and give. Did it ever occur to you that when the young boy that Pastor Emmanuel spoke about, when he spoke about the God that multiplies with bread and fish, did it ever occur to you that when he let go of what was his, everybody got blessed, including him? Because the Bible says there were 12 baskets left over. So not did he just bless everybody else, he got blessed in abundance because of his selflessness. Had it ever occurred to you what would have happened if he hid his lunch or he did not give his lunch away? I can tell you right now, there are many of you, God wants to open doors for you if you're willing to be selfless with what he has given to you. And so if God lays it on your heart, as I always say, to buy me that Range Rover, don't, don't, don't hold back. Let him use you to be a blessing. But jokes aside, whatever he says to you, give, give. This same Mary said to the people at the wedding, whatever he tells you to do, do it. And it's because they brought their water that they received the wine. I want to encourage you, whatever God tells you to do, do. And whatever he lays on your heart, do. I emphasize that because I don't want you to be moved by man. I want you to be moved by God. And so never feel pressured into giving grudgingly. Always ask the spirit to lead you when it comes to your giving. I want you to take a moment to bow your heads right now. And I just want you where you are in your seat to speak to God and just ask him to search your heart. It's a prayer that David prayed. He said, Lord, search my heart, test my heart to see if there's any iniquity within me. And I want you to take a moment to say, Lord, any areas in which I have been selfish, where I've allowed the Judas spirit to live and to grow within my heart, where I should have allowed the Mary spirit to win, forgive me, Lord. Don't just give me a head transplant, give me a heart transplant to be open to receiving that which you would lay in my spirit when it comes to giving, when it comes to generosity. Lord, help me that I won't allow the flesh to win, the flesh that will tell me this costs 300 denarii, that this costs too much, that you need to save this here and you need to spend this there, but understanding that you have given everything to me to be a steward, a good and faithful steward of what you have given 
to me. Lord, I pray that idolatry will not be on my heart when it comes to your money. Whatever areas it might be right now, just speak to God and say, Lord, forgive me. Help me to be a good steward. Wherever I've rubbed you in tithes and offerings, wherever I have not taken it upon myself to do further study, to do further research, to ask the questions because I've wanted to hold on to that which I thought was mine, which is actually yours, then forgive me, Lord, that I may come before you with an open heart, ready to steward the finances that you have given me. In Jesus' name, we have prayed. Amen. And it's on that note, church, whether you're in the auditorium or you are online, that we are actually going to receive our tithes and offerings.